from Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 4, it says, However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown in Christ Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possess. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the ways that we live our lives. It's the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, allow these words to be yours and not mine. Allow for us to enter into this place of worship so that we can grow closer to you and your understanding of your grace in our lives. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. So last week, we started in our Sola series where we looked at how Scripture holds all of the truth necessary for us to live into and and be into this life of salvation, to live as Christ has called us to live. But this morning, we take it a step forward and we look at grace. And something to know about me is I did not grow up in the church. In fact, instead of being a church goer, I would tell people, you know, growing up I was church adjacent. I had a lot of friends who went to church and because of their witness and their relationship with God, I became a believer and then later would attend church. But never in my childhood did I attend church. And so I really didn't have any fundamental doctrinal beliefs. And so I knew my mom was raised United Methodist and my dad was raised Southern Baptist. And so I was trying to figure out what was I. And it was this teaching on grace that helped me to see that the United Methodist Church is where I belonged as a worshiper and later where I would belong as a pastor. See, grace is something that we have recently heard and experienced around the Easter time. We know that Peter did something really big, and he messed up. When he denied Christ three times, just as Christ predicted he would, he messed up. And in that mistake, he needed grace. When he denied his teacher, his friend, his Messiah, he showed that he completely failed to have the faith that was laid out before him. And I can only imagine what must have been going through his mind the next day when he had to look at the other disciples knowing what he had done, when he had to look at Mary Magdalene knowing what he had done, how hard that must have been for him. You see, Peter had kind of formed his own prison because of his failures that he had deemed he had done wrong. He had barred himself in and locked himself up tight but he needed a key out. And we can look back all these years later and see that that key was God's forgiveness that was given to Peter through grace. Through the grace that God gave to his children then and the grace that God gives to his children now. And I think it's important when we discuss this concept of grace that just as often as we confess our sins and recognize our faults, we also recognize that in that confession, in those places where we fall short, we also need God's grace. We also need God actively at work in our lives. Our scripture passage this morning tells us that God's grace was poured out on all of God's children. Now, one of the questions that we ask our Sunday school kids, you may have heard before is, well, what is grace? And you may have heard the definition that grace is an unmerited favor poured out on God's children given by God. Or maybe you've heard, well, grace is the love and the mercy of all of who God is given to God's children, not because we've earned it, not because we've done anything to have God show us favor, 
but because God desires us to have it. Because God looks at us as his children and desires us to experience mercies and blessings and grace. Because that's God's work in our lives. In our scripture, we see Paul's words about this grace. That it is a good news that we have been saved by this grace. That we have been set free from this life that has held us down, that has held us captive from the jails that we have built around ourselves just as Peter did. And we are set free. And Paul spells it out for us. There's no mixing it up. When you read it, it tells us more than once. You are saved by God's grace. You are saved by God's grace. God did this to show the generations to come from this day, the generations that will come from us, God's great love, God's great mercy for God's people. Because you see, you were saved by God's grace. And it's not anything that we've done that has offered us this salvation. In fact, there's nothing you can do to earn the grace that God has given us. You can't live the most just life. You can't feed all of the hungry people in the world. You can't live exactly as Christ calls us and, and know that at the end of that, since you've done all of these things, you are saved. But it's just your faith. And this faith that is poured out in our lives through God's grace and God's work within us. There is nothing we do to earn God's favor. But God's favor is poured out in our lives in every step that we take. See, when I was looking at who I wanted to be in the church and what I believed, it was the Wesleyan view of grace that made me feel at home. My favorite form of grace is this thing in the Methodist church that we call provenient grace. And our understanding is that this is the grace that is acting within our lives. This is the place where God is already at work before we even enter into a relationship with Christ. This is the grace that if we look at a house, this would be the porch. Before we even enter the doors, this place of provenient grace is at the very beginning. See, this grace prepares our hearts and our minds for the understanding that who we are and how we live is not who and how God called us to be. It prepares in us a place that is willing to surrender our lives to God, to recognize that our faults are our faults, but there is something deeper and there is something greater ahead for us. And for me, this idea that God is at work in our lives even before we claim him, even before we give our lives to him, is the most beautiful picture of God's love for God's people. And then if we continue going through the house, we get to the door. And in the Methodist church, we would say that this door is this justifying grace. And this is where God's work in our lives is making our lives right. This is where we understand that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God's grace is still sufficient in that. That no matter how hard we try, we, we can't undo the things that we've done and, and dig ourselves out of the hole, but God's grace provides us a rope to climb to get us out, to enter into this new life, to be made whole again. You see, justification is just another word for pardon. Our understanding, according to John Wesley, is that this justification is the forgiveness of all of our sins and it is necessary for us to accept Christ, to recognize that who we are now is not in line with who God calls us to be. When we are justified by God's grace, we are made right with God. The whole world is opened up to us in a new light through the lens of a Christ believer, through the lens of someone who lives their life honoring the Lord. In sin, our image is distorted, but through justification, the image of God in which we were made is restored. All of this is done because God loves us, because God desires us to experience God's grace and God desires 
his children. And then the final understanding of grace in the Methodist Church is this idea of sanctifying grace. So we started on the porch with the grace that is acting in our lives even before we believe. And then we have this justifying grace, this grace that allows us to recognize the faults and for, for Christ into our lives and make us whole again to live a Christ life. And then the sanctifying grace is this place where we are made holy. It is here that we are shaped and to the people God created us to be. It's where our heart begins to desire what God's heart desires. It's where our heart begins to love fully and perfectly as God's heart loves. It's in this place where our whole lives, our whole beings, all that we are and all that we ever will be, are aligned with exactly what God has in place for us. This is how powerful God's grace is. There are many ways that we get to live into this grace, that we get to experience this grace. Whether we are reading scripture or studying, or we are participating in the sacrament of baptism like last week, or Lord's Supper as we do every Sunday in our early service and every first Sunday in this service. We get to experience God's grace when we enter into a place with a heart and a spirit for worship. We get to experience God's grace when we act in justice, when we fight oppression, when we call out racism for what it is, when we fight for those who have been pushed to the margin, who have nothing that they can do for themselves. We experience God's grace then. We experience God's grace most readily at times when we live into the heart of compassion that God has given us. Whether it's a phone call to a neighbor who is lonely, who just needed to hear someone else's voice, or it's recognizing that this person in our lives is hungry or has no food or doesn't have a job or is in the circumstance that is beyond their means. When we reach out, when we love them with God's love, that act of compassion, not only do we get to experience God's grace, but they get to experience God's grace. You know, I told you at the beginning that I would say I was church adjacent because I didn't go to church until I was 14. But I can remember the day that I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I was 10. And from the years of 10 to 14, I was a holiday Christian because I would make my family take me to church on Easter and Christmas because I thought if I was ever going to go, probably those two days were important. But I can look back now and, and witness and see that because of my friends who knew God and the grace that was in their lives and how they poured that grace out onto me, I got to know Christ. And I got to stand up here and be who I am today as a believer because of God's grace. When we participate in these means of grace, when we worship and we study, when we stand up for injustice and when we show compassion, we are opening our hearts and our lives to accept God's full grace, to see how God can continue to use us and to work in our lives. It's in these times where we often see the brightest picture of Christ. But the thing is, is we don't do these things so that we can earn the gold star in our book. We don't do these things because we have to do them. Our spiritual growth is a gift from God because of this grace. And we do these things, we live into this life because that's who God calls us to be. And when our hearts are fully aligned with God, we can't help to live into his grace and his compassion. And while last week we saw that this book, these scriptures have everything necessary, all the truths for our understanding of salvation, it is through grace alone that we are saved. It is through grace alone that we have our faith in Christ. It is through grace alone that we are provided eternal life with the Father. As I was thinking about this, I came across a story 
there was this minister. One night he was getting ready for bed and he hadn't slept well the night before. And so when his head hit the pillow, he passed out. And he immediately started to dream that he stood at the pearly gates with St. Peter. And St. Peter told him, okay, you need a hundred points to get through these gates. And the minister said, oh, this is going to be easy. Well, I was a pastor for 47 years, he announced really proudly. And St. Peter said, oh, well, that's nice. Zero points. He said, what do you mean? I, I was a pastor. Maybe you didn't hear me. He said, I, I heard you. Zero points. He said, okay, okay. Well, what about this? I visited the shut-ins in the hospitals, in the nursing homes, in the hospice cares, every chance I got. How many points does that get me? St. Peter again said, that's wonderful. Zero points. Flabbergasted, he said, okay, well, this one for sure is going to win me parts. I worked with the junior high boys at lock-ins. Tell me you know how hard that is. Of course, that wins me points, right? Peter said, I'm so glad you did that. Zero points. He said, okay, well, I developed recovery programs for those with alcohol and drug addictions. How many points does that get me? Again, Peter said, zero points. You still need a hundred more to get in. The minister was obviously upset and distraught, and he said, oh, Lord, only by God's grace could this happen for me. Peter smiled and said, God's grace, 100 points. You can come in now. Our scripture ends today with, this salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something that you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way in which we live our lives. None of the things that we've done earn us points when we stand before the pearly gates. We do those things because of God's grace active in our life. Because that's who God calls us to be. Not for our self improvement, not because we're commanded to do so, but because we choose to honor God in the ways that we live our life, in the ways that we use our gifts, in the ways in which we share God's grace. So while working with junior high boys is difficult and it doesn't earn you any points, or being a pastor is sometimes a little difficult, doesn't earn you any points. It doesn't matter. Because God's grace is sufficient for all our needs. And it is the gift that allows us to spend eternity and forever with Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for those times in our lives where we didn't recognize you where we didn't know you and yet you still were at work. You were still calling us into relationship with you. You were still holding us close. Lord, we praise you for being actively involved in our lives, for calling us away from the behaviors and the livelihood that separate us from you. We thank you for justifying us, for providing us with wholeness again. And Lord, as we continue down this journey, I pray you pour out your grace upon all of us so that we can continue to live as you intended us to live, so that we can continue to know that our actions and our words are done for your glory and not for our own. And at the end of the day, when we fall short, when we feel like we have failed, when we don't know where to turn, Help us to remember that it's not what we do that brings us into relationship with you, but it's who you are and what you have poured out in our lives. It's in your holy name that I pray. Amen.